Greetings from Crossroads Church in Aransas Pass, Texas. You know, as humans, we have breath, life, willpower, emotions, good days, bad days, strengths, and yes, sometimes weaknesses. But no matter where you are in life, the highs and lows, or how much progress is being made, we encourage you to take some time with us in watching this next video. Take care. Boy, that piano player did an amazing job this morning. Amen. Ooh, man, I tell you what, he is something. Is that no announcements today? I guess we don't want y'all to know what's going on. So anyway, good to see all of you. Pray that, uh, pray that you have a great holiday season this year. In case y'all are wondering what the church could get me for Christmas, a Lamborghini would be fine. So uh, that was not sincere at all, Shane. Don't even, don't even go there. Don't, don't get my harps up, my, my har don't get my hopes up just to dash my hopes and dreams here. So uh, the church gave me a Porsche a few years ago. Um, well, actually, Paul gave me a Porsche. It was a little toy, you know. What do they call those little cars? Those little no, Hot Wheels. There you go. It's little little Hot Wheels. No, it wasn't even like a remote control. It was just like a little Hot Wheels. I had to push it myself. But it was a black Porsche. It was a beautiful, beautiful car. But uh, anyway. Good to see all of you here today, and uh, we're, talking, uh, we're talking on Sunday mornings about the power of gratitude, and I want to, uh, I want to become a grateful person, more grateful. Uh, I've been around people that uh, are grateful, and I've been around people that are hateful. <laughs> I'd much rather, I'd much rather, I rejoice with the people that are grateful, and I make fun of the people that are hateful, and that has served me well over the years, so... Uh, uh, I, I'm so thankful. I, yeah, I was thinking uh, this morning as we were as we were seeing, and I'm joking about a car. I really don't want a Lamborghini, but um, I was thinking about uh, how that, and it's just human nature how we uh, something new that comes into our life. Something like if you get a new home or you get a new vehicle, and you're so excited about it, but after a while, the excitement it kind of wanes a little bit. It just kind of diminishes that excitement that you originally had over that because you find that even though things can be nice and brand new and shiny and colorful and pretty cool to to have after a while they get old but you know something that I have realized that I never it never gets old it never loses its influence and its power and the excitement that I have and that is to sit in the presence of God just that just never get old, that never gets old uh, for me and I remember um, growing up in church, and and I I have a lot of a lot of friends I went to church with. They've been out of church for a long time, um, and I uh, someone I think phrased it this way, and I, I kind of could could identify with this. They talked about when they were little, they had a drug problem. They were drug they were drugged to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Some of you guys think you're doing awesome by coming for an hour on Sunday morning. My parents drugged me to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, prayer service, youth service. Saturdays we went and cleaned the church. It's like, why don't we just live at the we basically just lived in the church? And my dad wasn't even a pastor. We were just like volunteers in the church. But I'm thankful that whenever I take a step towards him, he takes a step towards me. And, and James wrote and says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. There's just something transformative about being in his presence. We don't really have, um, we, we uh, obviously, I don't know what our church has to offer. We've got beautiful, wonderful people. I, I met a, was meeting with a, a lady recently, it was another ministry, and they were wanting to get into Aransa, so they contacted me. I met him down at the church, and, and the lady, she was from Rockport, and she says, uh, she told me, she said, yeah, I think I visited this church one Sunday. A friend invited me. And she said, how long have you been the pastor? I told her, she said, well, you had been the pastor here at then. She said, I just remember the music, and the music was so, I mean, the music was beautiful, and, and the people were so friendly. She said, I don't remember anything about you as the pastor. And I told her, well, that's about right, because I'm the least impressive person in this church. We don't have, we don't have, we can't offer a celebrity pastor. You know, I'm not a celebrity. I'm not a social media influencer. I'm, I'm not an entrepreneur. I don't know. I, to, I was supposed to be all those things. Best-selling author. How many books have you written? I don't even know if I've even read one. You've got to read one before you write one. 
But I'm thankful this morning that what we do have to offer is the presence of a holy God that when you step into this place, um, if you have an expectation for God to do something amazing in your life, boy, he will do it. He's just waiting. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hears my voice and open up the door, I will come in. I've shared that with people as an encouragement to receive Christ into their life. But when you go back and you read that, those words were literally contained in a letter to a church. Not to the world, but to the church. He said, I stand at the door and knock. And as followers of Jesus, we can kind of have to keep him on the outside and we don't really allow him to work. And I'm just, there's something special and amazing about his presence. I just can't get enough. It just never gets old. It just never gets old for me. And that's one of the things that I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I'm grateful that I was raised in a Christian home. My parents were not perfect. Uh, Victoria can attest the fact that I was very, very close to being the perfect father. Our parents, I, but I'm thankful. Uh, my mom was, my mom was an amazing, godly person, and uh, then there was my dad. And my dad was a my dad was a pastor and. He was respected and dignified and professional, and I'm none of those things, but I'm thankful for the Christian family that I was raised in. I'm thankful that I know him today. I'm thankful, I don't know about you guys, I'm thankful my name is written in the book of life. I get an amen here on that. <laughs> you say, man, I don't know, I, my life's been kind of rough. Well, as a follower of Jesus, you cannot lose for winning because our name is written in the book. I was honored to officiate a funeral yesterday, and boy, that's just the hope that we have as followers of Jesus, that death is not the end. And people that leave this world and go to be in the presence of the Lord, it's not like they're dead and we're alive. They are much more alive than you and I will ever be until we get into eternity. And I'm thankful that death is not the end, and that's the hope that we have, that we don't have to be fearful of this life, and we certainly don't have to dread the concept of death, because Jesus, the Apostle Paul said to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. And so I'm thankful that I have hope this morning that whatever happens in this life, God's going to see me through. And then when I'm ready to step into the next life, I hope I see some of you in heaven when I get there. Not, not that you, not that, not, let me rephrase that, not that you died before me. I, because some of you were only supposed to say good things at your funeral. I don't know what I'm going to say at your funeral. It'll be a moment of silence, I guess. If all we can say is good things about you. Can I get a good amen here now? <laughs> hey, why don't we talk about being grateful? Because I just got a little, bit, a little bit off track there. But I want to talk for a few moments this morning about uh, the power of a grateful heart. Paul said this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. I'm reading this under the NLT. says this, be thankful in all circumstances. He didn't say be thankful for all circumstances. He said be thankful in all all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Now, obviously, it's easier to be thankful or to have a thankful heart or sense gratitude in our lives when things are going pretty good. How many of your spouse likes you this week? Boy, that's a lot easier to be thankful than when the relationship, you're kind of struggling a little bit. Uh, I want to talk about, this morning, I want to talk about how gratitude can lead us to this amazing life of, of faith. And I know that sometimes uh, have, being thankful and gratitude is a really difficult challenge because maybe sometimes things aren't going really, circumstances, trials, storms that we're facing, just all sorts of things that are happening. Sometimes it's physical problems, sometimes... It's mental problems. Anybody got that going on this morning? <clears throat> sometimes it's financial. Sometimes it's family situations. Sometimes it's work. But often it's all of the above. Because many times the challenges, it just kind of floods in from every single direction. And sometimes it's a little bit difficult to have a grateful heart. But it's important to be grateful when things are going good. It's even more important to be grateful when things are going bad. When things in your life and, and the life that you're living right now probably is not the life you imagined when you were younger. 
You thought that in your young years that you were going to find Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright and live happily ever after. Right now, 50% of marriage is in a divorce. And they tell us 80% of the time it's the wife that leaves. Guys, get along with your spouse because if she leaves, she's taking 60% of everything. <laughs> and uh, the life sometimes that we imagine that we were going to live, it doesn't quite work out that way. And we have battle scars and we're wounded and we struggle and we go through pain and we go through sorrow. But <clears throat> here's what I want to encourage you. Boy, that's encouraging, right? But, but here's what I really shared that to say this, that oftentimes I see, you see this throughout scripture and just throughout uh, situations that you and I are aware of in our life. Many times when we're going through those deepest, darkest trials, God does not send sickness our way. I don't believe that. I don't believe that God is the author of confusion. God is not our enemy this morning. Jesus said in John 10:10, 10, 10, one of my favorite verses, there's a thief that comes before to steal, kill, and to destroy. When bad things happen in your life, God's not the author of that. You say, well, I messed up. And so now I've got to pay for that. Actually, you don't because Jesus paid for that on the cross. Now, yes, there are consequences to our actions and we need to live wisely. But I am telling you this morning that I'm thankful for his forgiveness. I'm thankful that Jesus paid the price on that cross 2,000 years ago. That he who, was, he who did not know sin became sin for us or a sin offering for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him, the New Testament tells us. But in the midst of our trial, in the midst of our broken hearts, in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our physical problems, in the midst of the, the challenges to our mental health, oftentimes God will use those things that the enemy means for harm. He will turn around for our good. He'll bring you through, through those situations and make you stronger and more anointed and more blessed. God uses everything. God does not waste anything in our life because all things work together for good. The things that God brings into our life. James said every good and perfect gift, gift comes down from the Father of lights. Jesus said if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much does your Heavenly Father, how much will your Heavenly Father give you the kingdom? And I'm so thankful this morning for His blessing. I'm thankful for His favor, His grace. I can't do anything to deserve it, but it is the free gift. How many of you like to get gifts? <clears throat> and I know, and <clears throat> I know you and I were probably at that stage of life. We like to give gifts as much or more than we receive them, but it's nice to be a recipient of a gift. And I'm thankful the greatest gift that we've ever received was when Jesus came and died for us. And Paul wrote and said, if God did not spare his own son, how much more will he freely give us everything that we need. And so I'm thankful this morning for his grace and I'm thankful for his mercy and I'm thankful that we can be grateful and it is important to be grateful in the hard times. Um, everything that God does through our life, he does as a result of the faith that we have. And I want to talk about that for a few moments because there are sources to live a life where our faith increases. I said a minute ago that many times we're not living the life we imagined when we were younger. We didn't factor in all the surprises that life would have for us and, and the losses and the grief and the sorrow that we would experience. We didn't factor in the illnesses that maybe we would have to struggle with and all those things. But I will also tell you this, that I don't believe that most Christians are living the life that God has called us to live. There was a very famous man in the, in the Old Testament by the name of Abraham. Abraham was a man that, that is honored and revered in the three great world religions. Abraham is literally the father of every Jewish and Arab person that, is it, that lives today. You read in Genesis chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 3, God makes this covenant with Abraham and said, if you'll leave your people, leave your your home, he was raised in the, and he was uh, lived in the area of Ur of the Chaldeans, which we know as Iraq. And um, so God brought Abraham out of that land and said, if you'll come to a promised land and you'll follow me, I will make out of you great nations. And that's exactly what happened. But sometimes we, we know about that story, but we don't know about Abraham's father. His, Abraham's father's name was Terah. 
And God, it appears that God actually uh, uh, appeared and, and revealed himself to Abraham's father. And Terah took Abraham and his family and, and actually left their home and began to travel to, to Canaan, which was the promised land. But for whatever reason, Terah stopped in a city called Haran. And so I think and they calculate it was about halfway between where they lived and this promised land that God want, wants to take them. And the Bible tells us in the book of Genesis that when Terah got to the city of Haran, it says that he settled there. He didn't make it all the way to the place where God... Now, his son Abraham did, and all of us have heard of Abraham, but very few have heard of Terah, because he didn't follow through and get to the place where God was leading him, this land of promise, this land of ministry, this land of blessing, this land of anointing. And that's where most Christians get. They get about halfway, and they thought, well, I'm on my way to heaven. We were rejoicing about, well, at least I was, rejoicing about the fact that my name is written in the book of life. So we're thankful for that. But there's a promised land, a land of promise that God wants you and I to live in where we're not afflicted and we're not addicted and, and we're not beaten down and we're not dysfunctional and we don't live according to our own strength and our own resources, but we step into this calling and this anointing that God has for us that we live this amazing life, a life of adventure. It's not an easy life, guys. I'm just telling you. The number one thing that you have to do to find that place of ministry or calling in your life is you have to be willing to get out of your comfort zone. And most folks don't want to do that. We just want to get... There are times, you know, Paul told Timothy, and I'm, this is out of the New King James Version, he phrased it this way, Paul told Timothy to, to endure hardship as a good soldier. Endure hardship. And sometimes God calls us to spend time on the hardship. But we don't want the hardship. We want the cruise ship. How many folks have ever gone on a cruise? Let me see your hands. And I have not gotten one single invitation from any of you folks. Maybe because you don't want me to embarrass you. And that's okay. That's all right. I understand. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. I don't try to embarrass people. Uh, but there's no kill switch on awesomeness. So I just that's the way I am everywhere I go, but it'd be nice if we could just stay on the cruise ship, but sometimes God calls us to live on the hardship, and we deal with the struggles. Did you notice what, what Paul told Timothy? Endure it as a good soldier. Endure it as a good soldier. I have letters from my son. He was in the, he was in the Air Force, and letters when he described boot camp, and uh, I did not I would, I did, they did not allow me to go in the military because according to the Geneva Convention, if I'd been in the military, it would not have been fair to the enemy. That was pretty good. I just thought of that, just like, quick, that just happened. Folks, that just happened, okay? And, uh, but, but these guys, and we have some of our guys, I, well, I think we've got some Navy guys here. This, amen? Salute you guys. Appreciate you. Thank you for your service. I mess with these guys all the time, but seriously, thank you for your service. And uh, boot camp was not a piece of cake. It's difficult. And, and being in the military, it's, it's difficult and there's challenges. And we are so thankful for those that go and serve and, uh, you know, on, on battleships or, you know, and a lot of our wars have been centered and focused in the Middle East. And so we're thankful for all these that go. But as a follower of Jesus, sometimes we have to understand that our, our calling is not the cruise ship, it's the hardship. And we've been called to wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. But the life that God's called us to live is a life of faith. So uh, faith has an evil twin, and it's called fear. And many people are living a life of fear, and that's what keeps them from getting out of their comfort zone. That and they don't want to be convenienced. Um, I, I, I think about, uh, you know, us American Christians. Uh, boy, the Bible says one of these days we're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. I don't know. Did you know that you're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ? Paul, Paul wrote about that. I, I don't know about you guys. I'm a little concerned about this. So here's the Apostle Paul that um, our, our, our Catholic friends... Uh, they look to Peter and think, you know, feel like Peter was the, the great influence and is the influence in Catholicism. But for Protestants, it's the, the Apostle Paul. 
and, and he wrote half the books. And we love Peter, and he, he has epistles, and, and uh, I, I think Bible commentators kind of feel like that the Gospel of Mark is really Luke's account because Mark was not one of the original disciples, but he was an assistant or associate of the Apostle Peter, so they felt like that Mark's Gospel actually came from Peter's accounts. So we are so thankful for Peter and his ministry and all those things. But, but the Apostle Paul, he, he wrote that, that one day we will have to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, this is not a judgment of whether you go to heaven or not, because if you're there, you, you're there. You made it. So here's the Apostle Paul. I think about the life, I think about the life that he lived. He has, uh, they call them prison epistles. Epistle is the wife of an apostle. <laughs> that was a pretty good one. <laughs> Oh, that was, I'm sorry for that one. Uh, no, no, an epistle is actually, that's just a, like a fancy religious word for letter. And so Paul had written prison epistles or, or prison letters, and we did a study in the book of Philippians recently, uh, which was one of his letters that he authored out of prison. So Paul was in prison. Paul uh, had, been, had been beaten with rods. Paul had been stoned. In fact, one time, uh, they, had, they threw stones at him, and the reason why they quit is they thought he died. And he may very well have, because then he writes a letter. He writes in one of his letters, he talks about, I know a man who went to the third heaven, and the third heaven in Scripture is actually the heaven where, where God lives and such. So uh, Paul, uh, and then eventually uh, Paul, he was martyred for the cause of Christ, wrote half the books of the New Testament. So we're standing at the judgment seat of Christ, and I pray that I'm not standing behind the Apostle Paul when he gets his rewards. Because that's what it is. It's going to be rewards. Now, everybody that receives Christ gets to heaven. But the rewards are not going to be the same. Because there will be people that had such commitment. And, and, and it's not necessarily these grand efforts and endeavors that, that we like to maybe focus that and say, oh, that's, that's it. That's the one that's going to get me the big reward. Because Jesus said this, he said, if you just give a cup of cold water in my name, just a cup of cold water. Jesus said the one that will be the greatest in the kingdom of God is the servant, the servant of all. But I pray I don't stand behind somebody like the Apostle Paul. Or say a Christian in the third world, in Asia or in Africa, that every day that they attend church, they put their life on the line. And stand, and stand at the judgment seat of Christ and hear the account. I, I said, you know, years ago when after the Vietnam War and then after it, it concluded, um, as in a lot of those places after wars, uh, Christians are targeted. And <clears throat> there was one Christian pastor that was, was taken out by the North Vietnamese who were communist. And they were taking over the country, took them out and, and said, if you renounce Christ, we may allow you to live. And he said, I will never do that. I will never renounce my Lord. And they said, well, what we're going to do then is we're going to kill your children. We're going to kill your wife. We're going to make you watch us kill your family. Then we're going to kill you. What do you think about that? And he didn't really know what to say. And the kids were old enough that they began to understand. And the kids are standing there crying, as you can imagine. And they said, Mom, what are we going to do? And Mom turned and said, it looks like we're going to have supper with Jesus tonight. And the soldiers shot the children, shot the wife, and shot that Christian pastor. That man and that family is going to stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ and rewarded. And I can imagine American Christians, well, Lord, Lord I could only make it to church once or twice a month because it just kind of was, I, I couldn't be inconvenienced. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't have to stand behind the Apostle Paul or that Vietnamese pastor. When I get to the end of my life, which if I keep picking on you people may happen really soon, <laughs> but when I get to the end of my life, I, and I can't say this about every single day, but I want to get to the place where I can say, Lord, I gave it all. I didn't hold anything back, but we'll stand before him and receive rewards based on the things that we've done. But the life that God's calling you and I to live is a life of faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says this. Now faith, this is the NIV. Faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Faith empowers us to believe God for impossible things. The life that God wants you to live is a life of faith, not a life of fear. Both of them are powerful and both of them can control your life. If you live in fear, 
Paul said, God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind or a disciplined mind where our thoughts are disciplined and our thoughts are, are focused upon him. I've, I've been thinking about this for quite some time and praying and, and maybe trying to get, uh, you know, maybe some revelation or uh, the Holy Spirit be, to develop thoughts and in my spiritual walk, that I can understand what it means to really walk by faith. Now, there's a whole chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, and, and uh, earlier this year, I would say uh, probably 30 days straight, I read Hebrews chapter 11, and I tried to get a sense of, of the type of life that God was calling us to live, because I believe, I believe that there's, a, there's an amazing life and ministry that God has for each one of us. This church will be successful, not based upon our pastor. Can I get a good amen there? The success of this church is not going to be the efforts of this pastor. The success of this church will be the efforts of the people that sit on the chairs in this church that will accept the calling and accept the challenge. And, and here I am, Lord, send me. What is it that you have for me? For that people will step up. I mean, we, we know this. We know this from church history. We know this from those folks that, that study the church growth that is not the pastor. Six percent of people that attend church attend because of the pastor. It's only six percent. But 84 percent attend because somebody invited them. Now we're getting ready to turn. We're getting ready to turn the calendar. Can you believe it's 2025? I don't look a day older. Can you can you believe is God good or what? Because I look so bad at the beginning of the year, I couldn't look a day older. <laughs> Who was it? I told Jim. I was blessing Jim earlier, and I was asking him how old he was because we were talking about retirement. And and uh, Jim's younger. He just said, Jim is just a, a young guy. He's a lot younger than me. And uh, he told me how old he was. I said, My God, Jim, you don't look a day over eighty. I pick on him. He's the biggest guy in the church. I don't know why I pick on him. That is not this this guys. This year is almost gone. We're almost into twenty twenty five. But here's what I want to challenge you to do. I want you, as we get into 2025, and I'm going to be reminding you of this challenge. I want you to bring one person to Christ in 2025. I'm not asking you to do five. I'm not asking you to do ten. I want you to begin to pray about it now. And if you pray about it, God will begin to bring people that are broken and hurting, people that are looking for answer, people that are in such darkness, and you can be light. You will be the only Bible some people ever read, and you will be the only definition of Jesus that people see. And we need to realize that we can make a difference in the lives of people. Just bring one person. Andrew was probably the least impressive of the disciples Andrew was the first one that followed Jesus. If I remember correctly, I believe he had been a, a, a disciple of John the Baptist, and then he began to follow Jesus. But Andrew did a great, he, had, he did something that was so amazing. He went and he got his brother Peter and said, come and see, I found the Messiah. That's the life of a Christian right there. That's the life of the Christian, is to introduce people to him. It's not about human personalities. It's not about celebrity preachers. It's not about social media influencers. It's not about New York Times bestselling authors. It's about introducing people to a person that can change their life, not just in this life, but for all of eternity. And I'm asking you to make the difference in one person's life. I'm asking you to step in the pits of hell and drag them out of the pits of hell and bring them to a Savior who will save them and heal them and deliver them and set their feet on higher ground and change their life and change their destiny. Oh, pastor, I'm too busy. Well, maybe knock about six hours off of Netflix a day and see if you, you know, Go on your phone, see how much time. Your phone, you literally can go on your phone and you can see how much time you see, you, you're on Facebook. Check it out. You might be surprised. Now, I'm speaking to myself here because we're all guilty. But I want you, I want you to determine, I'm going to bring one person to Christ. And to, how, many, how many of you would just think about it? I'm not asking you to commit. To, how many of you just think about it? And, and right now, begin to pray, Lord, lead me to somebody because God will lead, God, listen, God's not calling you to argue with people. God's not called us 
to win arguments. God's called us to win souls and to live this life, this life of faith. Because here's the thing about faith. Faith makes things that seem impossible, possible. Faith empowers us to believe God for the impossible. I believe that we serve a big God. Can I get a good amen on that? Boy, if I just get a few more amens, I can end this sermon and we can go eat. Can I get another amen? How many of you are hungry this morning? My God, I saw some of your pictures on Facebook of what you're eating. How could you possibly be hungry after this past week? Good thing about it is God kills the calories on Thanksgiving. Did you know that? Your scale was malfunctioning. God killed those calories. Don't believe the lies of the devil on that scale. <laughs> God's called us. I, listen, I believe that we serve a big God. Let's pray for big things. I, see, I, the life of faith is you pray and believe God for the salvation of your kids. You pray and believe God for the salvation, for a revival to take place in this community. There's something that's happening in this world. Uh, so I, I pay attention to things. I don't watch TV. I, I end up watching a lot of these podcasters and stuff on YouTube. Some of them are Interesting, I never thought I would sit there, and a lot of times I can't actually sit there, but I'm doing things around the house or whatever, and listen to a two or three hour podcast. But some of them are, some are very interesting, but there's something, there's something powerful that's happening in this world, and, and we're seeing it from, from people that you least expect it. I've, I've mentioned several individuals that I, I find fascinating. Uh, one is Russell Brand, who was an actor, comedian. He was, uh, he was married to Katy Perry. For a while, that was a pretty good thing to have on your resume. And he was, he was seriously, I mean, he had problems with drugs. And, you know, according to the world standards, he was, he was the man. But I began to notice just things popping up on social media. I began to notice, you know, the algorithms, they kind of find out what, uh, what you, so I don't know, you know, the algorithms, the algorithms on your social media know. That's why all those weird videos come up because they know that you're kind of, and, but mine are all Jesus stuff. That's all Jesus stuff comes up. Amen. So, so well, not 100%, but a lot of it. And so this video started coming up, and, and I thought it was strange because Russell Brand, he's talking about Jesus. And at first, he was, he was just kind of open and receptive. Then next thing I know, it has a, his a, his a, it has a, a, a video of him being baptized. And then just to sit and listen, this guy is absolutely brilliant. If you listen to him talk, he's absolutely brilliant. And then, and then I, turned on, I turned on one the other day. Didn't expect this. He said, man, he said, I don't know what to think of this. He said, but I was just praying. He said, then I just started speaking in tongues. Now, here's the deal. And people, people mock him and they ridicule him. While he was saying, I'm looking for the answer, everybody said, oh, he's amazing. He's courageous. But now that he said he's found the answer, now they're ridiculing him and they're scorning him and, and they're trying to marginalize him and they're trying to discredit him because, guys, I hate to tell you this, he's on Team Jesus. Anybody else here this morning on Team Jesus? And this young man got, and then I felt really good because I heard about some of the guys that he was friends with and some of his influences and mentors and people, people that were helping him grow spiritually. But it's absolutely amazing. And one of the things that I, I want to, I, I just, that was my introduction to my sermon, but I'll, I'll save. So if I save the rest of it for next week, I won't have to study the Bible this week. So I'll save the sermon. I'll save the rest of the sermon for next week. But I just want to, I just want to close with this. He's become a person of faith. And in one of his, one of his videos, he was talking about prayer. How many of you believe that prayer works? You believe prayer? I believe it. I believe it. And my life has been revolutionized and changed by prayer. By just simply, no, no, I don't mean I lock myself in my room. I'm not like the Pharisees stand on the street corner and, and scream, cry out, and do it in a way that brings attention to myself. No, I don't go in my house and lock myself in my room for eight hours and pray every day. But I believe that there is this discipline and there is this beautiful work of the Holy Spirit uh, and I've been looking at this and trying to understand what it really means to be spirit-led and spirit-filled. 
And Russell Brand said this, they were mocking him because he says that I believe in prayer. And all these people were just like, you know, crit being critical and pretty disrespectful and all these comments. Oh, there's no thing as prayer, it's only coincidence. That's just a coincidence. You pray for it, it's, just, it's a coincidence. And I don't know if this is original with him, but here's what he said. He said, all I can tell you is the more I pray, the more coincidences I see. You know, because faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And the last point I want to make is that when we start launching out into this life of faith, and I'll get into next week, we'll develop this more on how gratitude plays into this. But as we develop that, that life of faith, we have to understand God is not calling you to do difficult things. In your relationship with him, in your ministry that God's calling you in, God's not calling you to attempt difficult things. He's calling you to attempt impossible things. Oh, okay, well, where's the Bible for that? Five loaves of bread and two fish. And Jesus turns to his disciples and said, feed them. And they said, but we only have five loaves of bread and two fish. Jesus said, yeah, I know, feed them. So it's feeding, and that didn't include the women and children. It was 5,000 men, so easily could have been 10,000, 15,000 people there. So is feeding ten or 15,000 with five loaves of bread and two fish, is that difficult or is that impossible? Jesus is walking on the water, and Peter says, Lord, if that's really you, you know, can, can I come out there? And Jesus said, come on. So, so Jesus is telling Peter, come on, get out here and walk on the water with me. Um, walking on water, is that difficult? Or is that impossible? And throughout Scripture, we see, we see Jesus calling his followers, his disciples, don't, don't look for something that's difficult. Look for something it's impossible. If you learn to live the life of faith, if you will walk in faith instead of fear and allow the Holy Spirit to develop that according to God's word, if you live that life of faith within a relatively short period of several years, you'll find yourself going places you never dreamt you could go, doing things you thought you could never do, being used by God in ways you never thought that you could be used. Because God's not looking for ability, unless it's the praise team, then we need some ability there. If the only key you can sing in is Asia Minor, you're not going to be on the praise team. Okay, so there, there might be an exception. But outside of that, God's not looking for ability. He's looking for availability. And if you provide the availability, God will provide the ability. And you can live an amazing life, but you have to step out in faith. Dare to believe Him. And we'll talk about this, we'll continue this next week, but I don't want to talk too long because some of you are looking really grouchy right now. You're hangry. So for now on, next Sunday, I want you to bring a taco with you. You get hangry, eat that taco. We'll have, we could, I, I could preach the whole sermon, but right now I feel like it's in my best interest to stop. So here's what I want us to do. Um, we always like to have special prayer before we go because we do believe that God hears and answers prayer. And, and, I mean, guys, all I know to do when we pray for needs, and, and seriously, in all humility and totally dependent upon God, to just present the need before Him. Jesus said, ask, you shall receive. Seek, you'll find. And knock, and the door will be opened unto you. I read Hebrews chapter 11. It says, faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. But I think a beautiful description of the life of faith is found a few verses below that in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You must believe that he is and that he rewards those that earnestly seek seek him. We're going to ask, we're going to seek, we're going to knock this morning for your need. Stand with me this morning, and I want us to pray 
for each other, pray together, and let's just believe God. Boy, if you have a special need this morning, just lift your hand towards heaven. You may have a need in your life, physical, spiritual, in your family, whatever it is. We don't need to know, can't do anything about it anyway, except for pray with you, but we can lead you and we can agree with you on behalf of every single need. Pray with me. Father, we just thank you. We can come to you in the name that's above every name. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you that we can have a grateful heart. We can have a heart full of thanksgiving because of what you've done for us. We have failed you many times, but you have never failed us once. And the prophet wrote, great is your faithfulness. Father, I just thank you that we have the opportunity to present every need before your throne of mercy and grace. Your word tells us that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And although we may classify things as difficult and even impossible, Jesus, you taught us that with God all things are possible. Lord, we want to live that life of faith and step into your calling and your ministry in our lives, whatever that may be. And we just give the Holy Spirit permission to work in our lives in a beautiful and a powerful way to complete your perfect will. And for these needs, Father, we pray for healing. We pray for strength. We pray for peace. We pray for comfort, guidance, direction. You're not the spirit. You've not given us a spirit of fear. And also, you're not the author of confusion. I pray that our minds will be clear and open and receptive. Go with us as we leave this place. I pray, Lord, we'll let our light shine before men. They'll see our good works and glorify our Father, which is in heaven, according to your perfect will. In Jesus' name, we pray. Everyone said, amen. God bless you.